Robbie, we'll just need to make sure um, that live chat, if they want to, if viewers want to ask questions, that they probably not put their screen in full mode, full screen mode. Okay, yeah, because they won't be able to see the chat. Correct. So I, right. I just um, had a, a question about that. So I just want to okay. remind you and me both to let those know. I know uh, David was going to be joining us uh, pretty much right as we get started. He said he had class. He's teaching class at this time, but was going to let him out a couple minutes early to get here on time. That's great. <clears throat> Hello. And there's Rick. Rick, how are Hello. you? Good. How are you? Great. Looks like our panel is assembling here gradually. <laughs> yep. Waiting on one more. All right. How is it? How's my sound? I'm using my earbuds today. Does that sound okay? You sound great. great. Yeah. All right. I don't look as stylish as Jason does with his headphone yeah. on, but you know, <laughs> doing my best. <laughs> Well, he was, yeah. Robbie started it, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thought it would be retro and pull him out. Well, it's funny. I saw that blend, blend in. Yeah, I saw the email about the person in, in Mill. Who's from Milligan? That's me, Gary Dodd. Yeah, that's Gary. Oh, hi, Gary. I'm Rick. Yeah, we just had thunder. I'm in D.C. and a round of thunderstorms just rolled through. I was afraid I was going to lose power here, but so far yeah. so good. Yeah, it's just raining here. I think, as I was saying, I think uh, we had some pent-up demand for a snow day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good luck with that. Not the way yeah. the weather's been this year. Yeah. Yeah, I have a daughter at Lee University in Cleveland, okay. Tennessee. Yeah. So I don't know if they're getting the heavy weather or not, but I know there's yeah, some. Probably, yeah, they'll probably get some of it too, yes. <clears throat> Well, we lived in Arkansas for 12 years in Tornado Alley, so we're used to Ooh. heading for a cover. <laughs> That's rough. Yeah. So uh, things in Spring Arbor, uh, pretty calm, no, no storms up there? No, uh, no weather issues here. Uh, the only worry yesterday was when all of the Amazon hosted service servers were oh, working. Yeah, and I was hoping that wasn't going to affect us in any way today, but hmm. everything appears to be working fine. So, yeah, good. Yeah, we had um, JSTOR go down, and of course, then mm -hmm. then I realized that JSTOR is hosted on S3, so uh, that explained that. <laughs> yeah, I was accessing a database yesterday as well, and um, Amazon was the culprit. <laughs> Looks like many of our viewers are starting to show up. Um, and I'm just going to let everyone know, just an announcement, that we'll be starting right on time, so in about a minute. 
And um, well, if anyone is planning to ask questions from our viewers, <coughs> you will want to make sure that you're not in full screen mode. Um, and then you'll see a, a chat box on the right side of the screen st that states live chat. So we'll try to field those questions throughout the panel discussion today. But feel free to uh, ask questions and we'll get to as many as we can. <clears throat> and, and for those viewers uh, as well, we are also waiting on one more of our panelists who we know will be here right on time. <laughs> <laughs> With or without him, we will start um, and we'll just incorporate him as he as he arrives. I intentionally placed him last in the order of panelists introductions just in case. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so it looks like it is it is our start time. Uh, Robbie, are we are you good to go? I think we are. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm going to introduce myself. Um, I'm Kevin Pischke. I'm the Dean of Academic Support and Resources in the University Librarian at William Jessup University out in California. Um, last year, I was the chair of the Snezdek Library Leadership Institute, and and uh, I took it upon uh, Robbie and I took it on to um, host a webinar. Um, that's what you are all here today attending. So. CCCU has been a, a sponsor of the Snezdek Library Leadership Institute uh, for the last several years. And uh, the, this institute is really designed around uh, library administrators of CCCU institutions. And we get together once every summer for several days and deal with topics and have informed discussions um, around mutual, mutual understanding or mutual um, topics that we're all facing at different uh, university libraries, CCC university libraries throughout the country. Um, so without further ado, oh, and again, I will say this, this is my, my one plug for, um, if you've never attended the Snesdek Institute, uh, registration will begin soon uh, within the next couple of weeks. And we look forward to seeing new faces and familiar faces at the next uh, institute at, at Anderson University in Indiana. So Robbie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. My name is Robbie Bolton, and I'm the director of the library at Spring Arbor University. And I've, this is my second year on the planning team for the Snezdek Library Leadership Institute. So thanks for attending this uh, first webinar that we've done uh, as part of the institute. And before I, before I turn things over to our panelists to introduce themselves and get us started with opening remarks, I want to take a few minutes to share about how we got to this point. For the past couple of years, I've been following the Knowledge Unlatched program for funding open access monographs from academic publishers. I'm always excited that even if small libraries like ours can't afford to participate, we can still add the mark records for these open titles to our catalog. Many are excellent monographs, but I lamented the dearth of what I'll broadly call Christian scholarship. You know, the type of materials that make up many of the new titles that we purchase for our library collections, monographs and books from the Christian academic presses. So this led me to a conversation with a colleague, Dan Bull. Uh, Dan's the head of the library at Taylor University. And, and next thing I knew, Dan and I were leading a session at the 2016 Snezdek Library Leadership Institute on, on this very topic. We were asking questions of our fellow library directors and deans like, should we be more than just beneficiaries of open access type initiatives? Should we contribute, be consider contributing financially? Should we explore conversations with the Christian academic publishers about similar funding models? And what could we be doing in our, in our libraries to promote the scholarship of our faculty and of faculty at our peer institutions? It was a fruitful and lively discussion, but many of the, 2016 Snezdek attendees continue and wondered if we could try to continue this conversation with a, an even wider audience since the summer Snezdek Institute is limited to only 25 attendees every year. So that's led us here to this late winter webinar on the 1st of March, trying to continue that conversation that we started last July with a wider audience of librarians and library directors and deans. As uh, Kevin and I put together the panel that we've, assemb we've assembled here today, 
we were very intentional in trying to seek a variety of perspectives for this conversation. I'm excited that we have Rick from the CCCU and then Gary representing uh, our library directors and that we have panelists representing uh, book publishing and journal publishing. Before I turn it over to our panelists, I'd like to remind everyone that you are able to leave comments and questions uh, as you view the live feed on our YouTube channel. We have a rote list of questions that we're going to work through today with the panelists after their opening remarks, but we really invite you to leave questions and comments and we'll do our best to incorporate, incorporate them into the conversation. I've given each uh, of our panelists five minutes to introduce themselves and make opening remarks. So if you hear a lot of commotion at, at one point, that's, that's just me holding each of our panelists to their time limit and trying to give them the virtual hook. <laughs> so with that, thank you again for being here and attending this, uh, this SNESIC webinar and to each of our panelists for being here. I'm gonna start by turning it over to Gary to get us started. Gary. Yes, uh, good afternoon and I'm pleased to be a part of this panel conversation this afternoon. Uh, my name is Gary Dott. I'm Director of Libraries at Milligan College and Emmanuel Christian Seminary at Milligan. I have been the uh, Director of Libraries here for, well, actually, uh, Director of the Library since August of 2007. Um, and director of libraries uh, commencing with the merger of Milligan College and Emanuel Christian Seminary in July of uh, 2015. I began my academic library career at Milligan College in um, March of uh, 2005 as reference and collection development librarian. So actually, uh, on Friday, I will, uh, it will be my anniversary, 12 years here at Milligan College. So uh, uh, that's hard to believe. 12 years has just sort of blown by. It's been uh, a real um, exciting time. I made a transition in career from pastoral ministry into librarianship, and uh, it's, been, it's been great. I've really enjoyed uh, that transition in career. It, it seems to be a perfect fit for me. Um, <clears throat> I guess the reason why I'm here this afternoon is uh, I, I bring maybe a perspective, um, uh, maybe a common perspective among uh, library directors or collection development librarians who have been observing over the last number of years as uh, well-respected, reasonably priced um, academic journals from societies and academic departments have been acquired by, uh, by commercial publishers uh, with the often immediate result of a, a dramatic increase in subscription prices which uh, threatens to put uh, access uh, to the content of those highly respected journals out of reach of many of our libraries. And in fact, um, here at Milligan College, we have, uh, we're probably not alone, that over the, uh, the last number of years, we've systematically had to cancel uh, a number of our uh, theological titles that were once upon a time very reasonably priced and now have become uh, significantly more expensive, in some cases uh, dramatically so. I guess uh, against that background, I became interested in the open access movement. Uh, <clears throat> and as an observer of that movement uh, within academic circles broadly, I began to ask the question about, you know, what role open access does and might play within um, Christian and religious studies and theological seminaries and schools. Uh, and so at the end of 2011, I started a blog 
uh, called Omega Alpha Open Access. And it was a venue for me to learn a little bit more about open access generally and to make connections with um, what's happening out there in the religious studies and theology world in regard to open access. Um, I took a bit of a hi hiatus in 2015 and most of 2016, but I've sort of recently got re-energized and I've been uh, doing some uh, posts here. Recently, maybe as we have a conversation, uh, a recent post uh, is particularly relevant to our conversation this, this afternoon uh, from the Ithaca SR uh, study on uh, the research habits of religious studies scholars. And I, th I, th I found it, it had some interesting things to say um, about our, our venue here. Uh, I think that's probably enough to 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 get you oriented to my my uh, to the reason why I'm here this afternoon. I'll pass it on. Thanks, Gary. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jason from uh, Abilene Christian University Press. Hi. So my name is Jason Fikes, and I'm the director of Abilene Christian University Press. I've been the director. Uh, here for uh, about two years, and we are a traditional publisher. We have a strong background in publishing Christian higher ed titles. Um, we have a long-standing relationship with the uh, CCCU that goes back well before my work here, and um, we're one of the strongest publishers putting out materials related to Christian higher ed, uh, but we do that in a kind of a traditional model. So I think that I'm here, one, because the ACU Press has been reorganized, and uh, we are now in the library, the uh, Brown Library here at Abilene Christian. So I operate around librarians in staff meetings all the time. I think I know how they think. Uh, I'm in many, many conversations about open access kind of uh, materials that they do, uh, but I, I generally come at that from a different uh, perspective, and we'll probably see some of that as we uh, talk today. Um, we uh, the the other element that I would add is that you know we're we're trying very hard to give a platform to uh, faculty and those who want to write in uh, Christian publishing. So we have deep interest in just um, being in this conversation and seeing strong peer-reviewed quality Christian scholarship uh, be uh, distributed with people. I've got a similar background story to Gary's in that I was in pastoral ministry for uh, almost 20 years before I made the transition to what I do uh, now. And that transition has really helped me because we do a lot of trade publishing as a, an arm of what we do, which is called Leafwood Publishers. And that, uh, that trade publishing tries to put scholarship in the hands of churches and Christians across the country. And um, that uh, element of what we do uh, it seems to me to, well, it's a substantial and significant portion of who we are. So glad to be here today. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here with us, uh, Jason. I'm not going to, now going to turn it over to Rick from the CCCU. Rick. My name is Rick Ostrander. I, uh, I am not a librarian, not a professional librarian. I am the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Professional Programs at the CCCU. Um, I guess my most, uh, my best claim to fame as a graduate student would have been having a carol in one of the most famous libraries in the U.S., uh, Touchdown Jesus, which overlooks the Notre Dame football stadium. I had a little carol right up in the right shoulder or so of Jesus uh, signaling the touchdown there. Uh, but I'm not a professional librarian, uh, but my background is really, uh, for 20 years, has been in academics. First as a, as a historian, a uh, history professor, and then as a dean. Uh, so I've done some publishing in kind of the traditional scholarly uh, context, including a couple of books with Abilene Christian University Press. So I've really enjoyed a relationship with them. Uh, I, for six years, uh, I was provost at one of our institutions, uh, Cornerstone University in Grand Rapids, 
And we also have four children who have attended four different CCCU schools, uh, one of whom is at Anderson University actually right now in Indiana. Uh, so I guess I come to this conversation, first of all, as um, uh, an administrator, a former administrator in our institutions who uh, faced the challenge of, of, of funding libraries and, and supporting libraries during challenging academic times uh, and, and challenging uh, financial times. Uh, so I know what it's like to uh, face uh, difficult decisions as far as how we're going to uh, apportion our library resources, to what extent will we support print media, um, open access media, uh, electronic um, journals, and, and seeking to, uh, to really support uh, access to scholarship on the, on the part of our communities. Uh, in my current role with the CCCU, um, I am responsible for, uh, for research, and supporting faculty scholarship at the CCCU. So we have some grant programs, but we also have a Christian Higher Education Research Council. Uh, and so one of our commitments is to supporting and supporting the dissemination of research by our faculty throughout the CCCU. Uh, so I think it's important as an organization that we support our professors and provide opportunities for them to disseminate research uh, throughout their academic communities. But also, uh, we believe that good research is, is important uh, to get that uh, information in the hands of our faculty and administrators and students at our institutions. And so we are really interested in ways that we can foster and uh, promote uh, the dissemination of scholarship as widely as possible. So I'm not a professional librarian, but I'm very interested in this conversation. And uh, I would love to listen to and learn from uh, others as to how the CCCU can be an important partner in disseminating scholarship more widely at our libraries. So I'm really excited to be part of this conversation and look forward to hearing from others as well. Great, thanks, Rick. All right, uh, lastly, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, David David Hokema, and he joined us straight from his uh, philosophy class. So we did a, uh, a sound check with him earlier this week. So we're just uh, hearing him for the first time. David, are you there? I am here. Yep. Oh, wait, my microphone's. Let me unmute my mic. Looks like I, my. Your, your mic is unmuted. You're fine. Oh, it's un oh, it is unmuted? Okay. Okay. Yep. I, don't, I don't hear myself in my headphones at all. I guess I shouldn't. Is that right? That yeah. you suggested headphones and it is yeah. a lot clearer listening to everybody else. So okay, okay. yeah. So you're, you're hearing me. Um, first of all, I, I noticed looking at my image, um, I didn't run into a wall. We had imposition of ashes at the um, chapel service this morning at Calvin, uh, which I, it looks kind of strange. But I, I had been, hadn't looked in the mirror after chapel this morning. That's that's why I, I look like I'm bruised and battered, um, which we all are bruised and battered sinners in this season of Lent. Um, yeah, I, I feel Rick says he doesn't believe, belong in this company as a non-librarian. I feel even more a kind of outsider interloper here. Um, I guess my main qualification to talk about libraries is I love them and I value them highly. And I enjoy visiting libraries uh, of every sort from some of the libraries where I spent time in I, won't, I probably shouldn't say which Christian universities in which countries in Africa which are in the category of libraries in which a vast improvement in overall average quality could be achieved by a gigantic bonfire because there's so much garbage in some of those libraries uh, and all the way to extraordinary libraries. Uh, Calvin has a fine library um, in African studies, which is one of the areas in which I work. The Michigan State Library is world class and uh, it's just unbelievable to go into a library and find the wealth of material in one place and the same is true of Northwestern and African studies, the same is true of many of the universities, um, Firestone Library, where I did my work for my graduate degree at Princeton. So I'm a, I'm a lover of libraries, um, but my experience, I've never worked as a librarian. I've never, um, I've worked with librarians helping plan collections from time to time, but my experience is mainly from the standpoint of professor, um, administrator of learned societies uh, and publisher. And I think the reason why um, I was invited to this webinar, apart from the fact that they were obviously desperate and couldn't find anyone qualified, is that um, I have served for a little more than 20 years now as publisher of Christian Scholars Review, which I think you're all familiar with. Um, 
let me just say a little bit about my background. Um, I, I teach philosophy. I was just teaching a logic class. Uh, and I'll tell you later, I had a chance to interview my students today about their use of libraries and online versus print sources. They had some interesting comments. Um, I um, taught at St. Olaf College, Minnesota, then at University of Delaware, where I was the head of the American Philosophical Association, which is, oddly enough, <clears throat> was until two years ago about the only major disciplinary association in the United States that did not have a journal. Um, it did not publish a journal, but it does now. There's a new journal of the APA that's about, th well, three years old that is um, has been introduced. But we had decided that there were many journals out there, and we didn't want to put the imprimatur of the association on one of them, uh, and thereby pick fights with people who thought it had the wrong direction. So we didn't have a journal. Um, but from the um, from the APA, where I did work closely with the American Council of Learned Societies on a number of um, initiatives having to do with both print and non-print library access, especially uh, overseas access. Uh, I came to Calvin. I was a dean for six years, and on completion of my sentence, so oh, pardon me, my term, um, I became a member of the philosophy faculty. Uh, and But I've continued to work with Christian Scholar Review. Um, I'm also chair of the editorial board of Soundings, an interdisciplinary journal that was published at um, University of Tennessee, Knoxville is now been taken under the wing of um, of University of Pennsylvania Press. It's now published by an academic publisher. So I've worked with Soundings over over many years as well, and yeah, I've faced particularly with CSR the challenge of how do you keep a print journal viable when more and more people do more and more of their work online. That's where my conversation with my students today was interesting. I asked my students, when you're working on a new topic for one of your classes, do you tend to go to the library and look for journals and books? Do you tend to go to online sources? What's the mix? And most of them said, one person said 95% online, others said 75% online, others said, well, it depends on the topic. Um, one student said, books, what are those? I'm an engineering major. Um, but it was it sort of confirmed my my hunch that most students look first to online resources and rely more on online resources. Although several of them said, well, I use online resources to find things. I don't like to read on screen, so they'll make a printout or I'll go to the library and, and find a book. There is a mix, but I certainly have noticed over my 20 years at Calvin a steady decrease in the traffic in the stacks in our excellent library of students looking looking for books in the library. And of course, um, the difficulty of, of maintaining journal subscriptions. When I was dean, we talked a lot about that because I was dean for the sciences as well as uh, some of the humanities. And the science journals have gotten astronomically expensive in many cases. Even astronomy journals are not the only ones. Um, that these <coughs> these are, uh, yeah, as, as uh, as uh, Gary, I think, already said, journals get picked up by commercial publishers, and those that are essential to a field, they know there is no limit to what they can charge, just like pharmaceutical companies picking up drugs that, that some people have to have. And that creates very, very difficult um, problems of access. I, it seems to me that in a lot of the areas that are most important to Christian colleges and universities, there is still a much stronger presence of print publication than in many other areas. Um, it seems to me that in areas, especially in humanities, history, philosophy, religion, <clears throat> literature, uh, for several reasons. One is that we often think in big chunks, and it is so inefficient to read a whole book on Milton or a whole book on Quine or a whole book on on Bonhoeffer on screen. Uh, so we think in big chunks, so books are still very viable. Um, another is that we're just rather conservative. I used to say that philosophers really don't want to read anything they can't take to the bathtub with them, uh, and it's dangerous to take your, lap your laptop to the bathtub. Um, and another is just that, yeah, some, the, the, the economics are different in these fields. Um, we don't have very many journals that are that are hideously expensive to buy. Um, I have been told when I've talked to librarians about the print versus online access for a journal like Christian Scholars Review, which now costs about 
$45 a year for libraries that they don't even look at journals that cost less than $100 because the saving is so infinitesimal. They look at the journals that cost over $5,000 and try to cut as many of those as they can. So print is viable for something that is relatively low cost. One thing that has kept CSR alive, uh, and this is something you may be aware of or maybe not, but <clears throat> CSR distributes primarily through big boxes of books that are sent en masse to campuses that are affiliates. And so that greatly reduces our subscription fulfillment costs. Very few of our copies are sent individually wrapped and labeled, except for libraries. Uh, and that's kept our costs down. We remain in the black year after year with the very modest subsidies we get from member institutions because of that unusual distribution pattern. We do not yet have uh, a, a system of online access that is, in my judgment, nearly satisfactory. Uh, we are in a number of databases, um, but not nearly as widely disseminated as we should be. The uh, access is not as convenient as we should be. One of our one of my priorities for the editorial board meeting next month, uh, we have a new digital editor. Some of you may know or know of Tim Dalrymple, um, who uh, has done a lot of work with online access for Christian groups. He's going to work with us to try to find a way to integrate bibliographic access, which works fine already. We're in the ATLA uh, indexes and other index indices. Um, bibliographic ex access with full text access and make it more appealing. We hope not undercutting any incentive to subscribe and print, which of course is always the worry. But frankly, I'm more concerned about getting it out than about keeping the income stream up. We may have a much lower income stream in 10 years, so be it. Um, but the journal continues to be widely read, but not as widely accessible as it should be. Great. Thanks, so, yeah, David. Those are, my, those are my thoughts. Stop there. And David, we're glad you're here today uh, representing a Christian Scholars Review. So I'm. we're going to kind of work through some questions. And again, I'd remind all of our attendees, if you have questions for the panel, type them into the comment box on the right. Um, and before we kind of move any further, I'm going to remind our panelists, uh, we've been muting you as we've uh, as we begin you an opportunity to speak. So all of your microphones should be red right now. Before you respond to a question, click that microphone and uh, turn off the red mic. And then when you're done responding, uh, if you can mute yourself again, uh, that would really help the uh, uh, the experience for our, our attendees. So the first question I want to ask uh, of our panelists is kind of the the one I mentioned in our our introduction, the introduction that I gave. In many uh, open access initiatives, there seems to be an underrepresentation of the types of materials many many of us purchase for our libraries. If we search the directory of open access journals. Uh, we'll find very few journals from Christian, much less evangelical perspectives. Of the different open access monograph initiatives, there are few, if any, of the Christian academic publishers uh, that many of us purchase uh, large swaths of our library collections from. In your opinion, why is Christian scholarship under underrepresented in many of these initiatives? Um, maybe I'll just jump in here since open access is my sort of gig. Um, <laughs> I think I think for me, and I think David mentioned that he used the word conservative, and I, he didn't, as I understand, he didn't mean that uh, politically. He meant it uh, in the sense that um, uh, Christian and, uh, for that matter, humanities scholars are are. Uh, creatures of long tradition and uh, over time we build up uh, a sense of uh, you know uh, trust in reliable and reputable sources of information and uh, I, I guess this the short answer is uh, is we are uh it is those traditions that both serve us and 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 fail to serve us in a in a new environment when it when there's different economics at play uh and and questions about access um 
so I think in general, uh, uh, scholars are 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 either unaware or not adequately aware of what open access is all about, and and coupled with being used to a model that they have lived with for or their discipline has lived with for many many years, uh, centuries in fact, uh, and so it it's. Um, we're fighting against a certain kind of tradition of an, uh, inertia there uh, that um, that we have to come up against in order to uh, to think about new thoughts in this way. Robbie, I would add that another of the challenges that we're running into is. Um, Robbie, can I add to that? Uh, you know, I, I think one of the challenges we're running into is that the a lot of the publishers can't uh, publish things in open access for um, humanities uh, scholarship. That uh, the funding sources of National Endowment and other places, they they you know Christian or religious things are not what they'll put um, big grants that are available. So a lot of the open access projects you see have that funding behind it, and uh, Christians can't get behind that easily because there's not a simple model for putting that scholarship forward financially. Yeah, let me, um, am I on? Yes, um, go ahead. Um, I, I, I actually went to the open source scholar uh, journals database, which I haven't really used, and I was kind of surprised to find that Basically, none of the major philosophy journals that I read are there. None of the major theology journals that I read are there. It's a very haphazard sort of collection. I think there are 54 philosophy journals, some of them quite reputable, some of them very specialized. There's only eight theology journals listed. Um, and if you look, I mean, I, I'm, just, I'm looking at the Christian Scholars Review, which, which is available full text through um, EBSCO Academic Search Complete, uh, through uh, ProQuest, um, through Gale's Academic One file, uh, we're not in JSTOR. We're talking to JSTOR about getting out of JSTOR, and there are these access, which is not open access, I and mean, that is subscription access. It's full text subscription access, which is the way most leading academic journals, academic journals have gone. I don't see leading academic journals in philosophy uh, going to entirely uninhibited open access. Though in some cases, this is more I think in Again, the librarians will know more about this than I do. Um, in science and social science, it is sometimes a condition of grants that the results be published in a non-fee open access um, uh, medium, uh, which of course is a great incentive to do that. Um, and I, you know, I don't know whether funding sources are, an, I'm sure they're an influence here, but it just strikes me there are so many different forms of online access and at least from what I've picked up and this is very you know very fragmentary um, unrestricted no fee open access has not gotten very far with humanities scholarship um, it's it's very desirable in some ways but I can see reasons for being very cautious about that so I wasn't I was surprised not so much that there weren't Christian journals but that there were so few journals that I would regard as leading journals in that open access database. Uh, let me just briefly add to that. Uh, you know, I, I think one issue involved here may just be the uh, the fact that Christian scholarship in general, um, in, in terms of the uh, the out the level of output compared to our secular colleagues, uh, has you know historically lagged behind. Uh, obviously, Mark Knoll spoke to that couple of decades ago, but I, I think we're making progress, but the fact that we're underrepresented in the open access areas may also be a, a function of the fact that uh, our institutions tend to be, uh, have high teaching uh, loads and our faculty uh, in the production of Christian scholarship um, is not always at the level of what we see in secular uh, scholarship as well. Uh, I think if, in my experience with Christian publishers, uh, they are adaptable if there's, I mean, there, you know, is um, 
uh, they, they have a need just as much as any publisher to uh, to meet the bottom line and to be uh, to adapt to the market. So I think if they understand that there are clear uh, market incentives in a market for uh, open access uh, publishing on the part of whether it's ACU Press or a number of the publishers in Grand Rapids, um, I think Christians are and can be adaptable. They just need to, to see um, the the imperative to do so. And if the market is moving that direction, uh, I think they will be more than happy to adapt to that. Yeah, that sounds right to me. Maybe uh, I could I could briefly add that um, um, you know David mentioned uh, the journals that he goes to and and again that's part of that tradition. Um, we we have a relationship a, a long standing relationship in the era of print that uh, that the the medium for scholarly communication was. Um, you know, controlled largely by, you know, the person who had the, the printing press. So, uh, so publishers actually developed uh, a disproportionate uh, control over the scholarly communication um, enterprise, which is, as the, as the term suggests, a communication between scholars uh, uh, getting our research out to our colleagues and to the to the larger world, for that matter, if appropriate. Um, and in the age of print, we had no choice but to use uh, the medium that was available to us at the time, uh, namely uh, the, the printing press. And so we struck this bargain with uh, publishers uh, that uh, that they would help us to disseminate uh, the results of our research to colleagues and the larger world. Uh, here we are in a digital world in which um, anyone, you know, can be, can assume with a little bit of, uh, a little bit of training and expertise can assume the role of a publisher and the, the potential is there for scholars to regain direct control of communication with their colleagues through the research products uh, that uh, that result from their from their own uh, exploration and topics and whatnot. Uh, the, the problem again is just that you know we're so used to a system in place, and and what we're what we're almost up against is that um, is that the publisher who controlled uh, d the distribution in the age of print is quickly becoming uh, 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 gaining that control in the digital era when that need not be the case um, the, the challenge is to get scholars to you know to, to sort of like take back uh, their own reputation, as it were, um, and to use their scholarly reputation to create new venues for communication. Um, this, uh, you know, of course, uh, takes some effort and some rethinking, but uh, but it is a way forward. Um, you know. Uh, the academic uh, uh, communicate uh, scholarly communications endeavor uh, is not a. I mean, Rick mentioned uh, market forces, and and there certainly are market forces in the publishing industry, but um, but basically, scholars work on a on a reputation economy. So they're not they're not doing their research. Uh, to make money per se, that's sort of wrapped into their, um, you know, to their academic careers. I guess unless you're doing, you know, pharmaceutical research or something like that. But uh, but most humanities scholars and religious and theological scholars are not doing what they're doing to to make money. 
And so if we can take at least that, that factor out of the equation, we may be able to build some flexibility into the, to the ways in which we, um, we communicate with one another. Yeah. Uh, we, we have a golden opportunity in the digital era to do that. Great. Thanks, Gary. Um, I want to want to move us to a maybe just a slightly different question, if I may. Uh, one of one of us on the panel that's a librarian, but uh, I'll, I'll still ask this to uh, all of our panelists: What role do libraries play? What What can we do uh, in supporting and disseminating the work of Christian scholarship? Or is is uh is our main role is paying for it? Is that is, <laughs> is that our primary role? I I could give you um, uh, four four ideas on that front. Um, uh, one one is that um, the uh, press is is well, or a a library is a, a, the repository that a lot of the places have. You know, the a place to store the research of. Uh, scholars who have published in other places as well as to store uh, student work. I think there's a place for libraries in doing that. I think there's a second, there's a place for uh, digitization of projects, which is very similar in that of getting primary materials and making them available to scholars, uh, really unlocking some things uh, and, and creating broad distribution uh, otherwise, things that uh, people can't get their hands on. Uh, third, there's an element of peer-reviewed research by faculty that uh, I think libraries can have uh, some element to play uh, with, with collaboration of professional societies and groups that they have had interactions with. If their faculty um, can can help curate and uh, build a relationship, that you can have that. But that's that's fundamentally different from the repository, which is just really digitization and distribution, it's a, a discoverability question. Peer-reviewed things start to say, uh, what's doing what Christian uh, scholars has done for so long? It's That's a, a, a solid journal that's pr producing material. I think libraries can have a role in that. And then the fourth thing that I have heard that libraries can do is trying to support their students uh, and through various textbook initiatives to try to reduce the overall cost uh, by partnering with faculty uh, to uh, try to help uh, uh, de defray some costs. And among the administrators, I'd hear, love to hear Rick's perspective on this, if you were going to rank these, that one about supporting the cost of students is the one I hear kind of surfacing uh, the most. The uh, repository may be second, the primary sources being third, that it's expensive, uh, but um, important to do, and the, and the lowest one being the peer-reviewed research, which if they can do, terrific. But that element of supporting uh, teaching on their own campus through textbook initiatives is the one I'm hearing the most that libraries can do. But I'd love to hear other people's thoughts. Let me share a couple of thoughts. Um, <clears throat> when you talk about students, I was gonna say that in my experience, in my observations, one of the most important contributions of <clears throat> a good library staff like ours at Calvin <clears throat> has to do with the difficulty of getting students to understand how they can make reliable quality judgments when there's so much stuff out there. Uh, our librarians, I'm sure many of you also, have put together very good lists here are some online sources to use if you're working in anthropology. Here are some online sources to use if you're working in psychology. And when I asked my students today, what, where do you go? I said, you know, I, I said, you know, what about the fact that if you find a book on the, on the shelf in the library, it's published by Notre Dame University Press or Abilene Christian University Press or Oxford University Press, you know that it's been carefully edited and selected. The stuff you find online, you don't know that. And they said, oh, we use the disciplinary research guides that librarians have prepared that helps us sort the wheat from the chaff. So that's that's a great contribution. Um, another um, another thought that it just slipped out of my mind in favor of this one. <laughs> um, you know, libraries do clearly have an important role in supporting 
scholarship, peer review, and so forth. I don't know, should libraries get more into publishing? I don't know. I, I guess I see both some pitfalls and some advantages there. Um, oh, and the story I was going to tell was that I met a man who's a law professor at U of Michigan, who when he moved to U of M, met with librarians, the law library, and said, yes, I'd like, to come, I'd like to come have a tour of the law library. And they said, oh, that won't be necessary. He said, what do you mean? He said, we know your specializations. Every week or two, we will bring over books that we think would be of interest to you so that you can look through and then return when you're done. I thought, wow, now there is a concierge service library that I don't think most of our institutions could, could support. But that's, you know, if you want a gold standard of library service, librarians are thinking like the prof and thinking, oh, this book would interest Professor so-and-so. Um, what I was going to say about Christian Scholars Review, uh, yes, we publish peer-reviewed work. The peer review press is very important. We have always considered <clears throat> that the work we do in evaluating and communicating with authors is as important as the work we do in publishing their work eventually, <clears throat> and that the work we do with authors who probably may not make it to the point of having publishable work is no less valuable, that we think it's, it's, a, it's a community of scholarship in which part of our job is to publish good work that deserves a readership. Part of our job is to help people who don't really quite know yet how to do work that will reach others and be helpful to them to get from very, very halting efforts to better efforts. So, you know, and this, and most journals don't think that way. Most journals simply say, you know, if you're not up to our standards, we'll send you a polite rejection letter and that's it. Um, but CSR has always thought differently. Yeah, uh, let me speak to a, a couple of the comments uh, made uh, by the others there. Um, I think, uh, I, I guess just, just to echo some of those com comments, I, I, I would, uh, I see a, one real value of our institutions in as being communities of learning. Uh, you know, I think that's what our students are looking for increasingly in the in a you know an online and digital uh, digitized world, what the value that we can bring is is a, a particular place, a community, uh, real life faculty who care about them as persons, staff members who do, and so to think about the library in terms of uh, as Jason said and, and, and David did, and as supporting Christian scholarship, uh, but one important way it does that is by. Uh, seeing itself as a service to students who are really learning what it means to be scholars and what it learn, what it means to make discriminating uh, judgments about good scholarship and what constitutes legitimate uh, scholarship and, and knowledge and what is simply out there in the the chaos of the web. And so I think libraries can serve uh, and need to serve as those guiding institutions for our students to help them understand what scholarship really means. Uh, and then secondly, doing that with a particular place. Um, and I think one positive trend that I've seen in our institutions is the extent to which our librarians really uh, take seriously a commitment to being an attractive place for study and reflection. In addition to offering repositories and online uh, services, I think students are looking for, uh, in some sense, a, a kind of a countercultural um, place where they can uh, reflect and 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 uh, be inspired by the, the learning tradition. I think our, our libraries can provide those uh, communities and those places where real learning and scholarship can take place. So I would encourage us to think about um, how our libraries really serve the unique institution and setting that we're in as we seek to advance scholarship. Yeah, yeah I, I'd uh, I'd uh, um, second that. Uh, it, it's sort of interesting, uh, particularly the terms of uh, the idea of of library as place and space. Uh, it was it was very it's very interesting. I mean, we we when I first started uh, at my library, the you know the collection was basically. Uh, pushing users out of the building entirely, and so sort of what I've been all about in the last or in the initial years was, you know, opening the spaces back up for users to reacquire that space for um, for learning experiences. 
Um, which is interesting because I've seen photographs both of our own institution and of other institutions where it seems like in an earlier time there were those spaces provided in the ar architectural design too. And something happened in the 60s and, and 70s where, you know, just collections became crazy and, and, um, and the whole idea of the library as just a, a warehouse for information resources sort of took a life of its own. So I think, I think um, you know, I like the idea and, and, and I'm not alone in being a library that has um, turned to our user and said, you know, what can we do to make our, our spaces uh, welcoming and inviting and enriching uh, for you? Uh, so that, you know, that's a that's a great place. Great, thanks, uh, thanks all of you. I want to give a one quick question that just came up from one of the attendees um, earlier. I think Jason, you're the first one to mention institutional repositories. Uh, well, the question is, uh, at her institution, she's having a hard time with professors and faculty buying into a, an institutional repository because they want to publish with reputable reputable publishers. I don't know if any of you would have a response to that. Uh, if you don't, I might have a few words to say. Yeah, actually, um, we, uh, we launched our institutional repository after a number of years of conversation. Uh, we launched ours last year. Uh, and we had lots of conversations with various uh, units and stakeholders on campus about how we wanted to be a commons idea for uh, for various kinds of documents, not just scholarship, but but also you know uh, artifactual and archival and documentary as well as academic. Um, it is hard to get buy-in because um, because professors tend to be very busy. I think what helps a little bit is. Um, is uh, if the librarians are willing to do some of the legwork for professors, that certainly helps. Uh, the other idea that's implicit in your in your question uh, is the idea that you know um, the repository is not uh, is not a alternative to a publication in a even in a traditional venue. In fact, the repository can be a second uh, layer of access dissemination after you know an article finds its way into a journal. You can get permissions from the publisher to post uh, that article in your institutional repository. Then suddenly it becomes uh, effectively open access at that point. Uh, the technical term in OA circles is this is green open access, the idea that uh, we're putting the artifacts of your research in the repository for, an alter uh, for another way, another layer of access. So it's not either or, uh, it's, it's, it can be both and easily. Yeah, thanks, Gary. I think uh, if no one's jumping on that, I think you adequately responded to that question. Um, I'm going to move to one of the other questions on our list. Are, are monographs and peer-reviewed journals the best way to disseminate the research and writing of faculty at our institutions? Let me just uh, jump in really quick here because I think uh, another uh, very strong tradition um, in our academic institutions is the whole idea of, you know, tenure and promotion and, you know, that you have to pay your dues as a, as a scholar. And that's certainly appropriate. Um, the problem, I think, and this is a conversation that is ongoing also in open access circles is, is, you know, um, are, are our procedures for tenure and promotion narrowing the options that could legitimately qualify as uh, as scholarship that reflects um, the quality of research that a given scholar does, uh, and it's an open question. 
but you know there are certainly other venues um you know blogs and websites and podcasts and and different kinds of media the problem in general is that uh, tenure and promotion committees or their or the uh, policies that are developed around them uh, say that you know that you know these things don't qualify uh, mainly because they you know they didn't qualify you know <laughs> hundred years ago or even fifty years ago or even twenty years ago or even ten years ago uh, and so in a way the whole procedure is sort of behind the times um, yeah okay <laughs> I, I we're running low on time Gary so I want to make sure everyone else gets a chance to jump in probably have a time for another one or two questions after this does anyone else want to jump in on that question? Yeah. Let me speak to that. Uh, sorry, Jason, I jumped um, in real quickly. I, I do think um, uh, our understandings or under notions of scholarship are evolving in the Christian uh, community. And I think the so what constitutes acceptable scholarship and acceptable venues for distributing that uh, are changing, probably not as quickly as the definitions are or the cultural understanding, but for example, I have a friend of mine who's a history professor at one of our uh, stronger institutions, and he um, does a, a wonderful blog uh, on Christian, uh, really on American history, American culture, and I think he's actually been able to use that blog as part of his evidence for for promotion to full professor there. So I, I think things are are changing, but probably not as quickly as the cultural understandings are. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, and my quick thought is that there has to be uh, peer review, Wh whatever it is, however that form comes out. There's in um, students are learning and they learn quickly how to tweet and how to make Facebook posts and how to make blog posts. And the, the real issue and that what, what grows research and what grows scholarship is the conversation that's built around a text um, to, to make it stronger. So just making something digitally available won't count as scholarship. What will make it scholarship is when there can be a network of people who can build peer review around something to make it stronger. So um, that, that to me is the challenge. And how do you do that in different ways? I, I re, um, I've, I've, I've broken down because people cite things and the only source is on Twitter. And that tweet really is, that's the final source of where something came from. Uh, and we're in that kind of a world, and it's evolving in front of us. Yeah, I would just add very briefly that uh, yeah, these, these issues of peer review, the role of monographs, the role of traditional scholarly journals, online publication, et cetera, is really tied up with the question of how we build the strongest faculties that we can. And of course, it's tied up with, with uh, standards for tenure and promotion. And I, I guess I feel like there's just two poles here that can't ever be fully resolved. One is, that we have inherited a system where peers evaluate each other's scholarship, that major presses have very high standards, that most manuscripts get rejected or drastically rewritten, and it does make them better, and it makes them more responsive to criticism, makes them better sources for other scholars and students. On the other hand, when I was a dean, I was very aware that one of the most challenging pro uh, tasks and in hiring new faculty was to re-socialize them to understand how scholarship needs to serve a community of learners, to use Rick's, Rick's term, and not serve either the 16 people who follow pre-Columbian literary analysis of, of, of temple inscriptions, and not serve primarily my personal advancement as a scholar. I mean, those, those are so deeply bred in by our system of highly competitive uh, graduate education that we really need to rethink that and it's just it's just a very difficult balancing act that has no easy solution but I see a role for monographs and journals but I also see a ne the necessity of saying hey that is not the definition of what is worthwhile thanks thanks David uh, we're running low on time and I get we have one more question I think we have time for and uh, one of our one of our questions, uh, and someone's asking, what was the name of Gary's blog again? I think it's Alpha and Omega or Omega Alpha Open Access Blog. When Gary takes the mic again, he can uh, he can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But here's the final question we'll close with from one of the attendees. If one of the first places that our students look for research is online, 
how can we get, how can we help to get more of our Christian scholarship into this format and into the, uh, this virtual location? We're all struck dumb. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's no one answer. I mean, there's lots of different ways. Uh, and, you know, I can think of lots of wrong answers. I mean, the, the, one of the wrong answers would be we have to have a whole separate network of Christian scholarship that we Christian scholars support so that will make sure that, you know, that's not going to work because we want to have scholarship from our colleagues at our colleges sharpened and refined by conversation with those who don't share Christian values but have something important to say. Um, but I, you know, I don't know. There's going to be as many different ways in as there are different journals and different areas of inquiry. You just have to keep thinking about um, looking for opportunities and finding finding people who are Twitter savvy and also enjoy reading peer-reviewed monographs to help us on that path. And, and I would add, if, if we could make this not about just making things um, well, the, the Open Access Initiative wants to make things just free, and free sounds great. I was in pastoral ministry. I love free. Free is great, but that might not be the only way. Maybe cost-effective or, you know, we, we everything that we put for Abilene Christian University Press, we put it in a digital form. It may not be the digital form you love, but, but, but we're, we're trying to. Yeah, I would echo David's remarks that I think it's hard to, uh, it, it so much depends on the different disciplines we're talking about. Uh, what, expanding online access or online scholarship in the sciences looks very different than it, it does for the humanities or social sciences. So it's got to be a lot of different methods and approaches depending on the discipline that, uh, that we're publishing in and that our students are, are studying in. So for the sake of time and all of our viewers, I just want to make sure that we um, uh, wrap it up on time, which we're now officially a minute over. So panelists, I thank you for your time. And I, I think it was a fruitful conversation. I think the conversation should continue on. We appreciate CCCU's and leadership and involvement with the Snezic Library Leadership Institute, but also for all of our institutions, um, all of what you do. Um, I, again, panelists, thank you. Uh, you have done a fantastic job, and uh, we look forward to having this conversation more in the future and in, in, in other ways. Thanks Great. for that. Yep. Thank you, everyone. This worked well as an interactive uh, <laughs> setup. And on that note, I think we should probably start um, closing it out. <laughs>